Yellowstone National Park sits on top of a super volcano. In fact, much of the park resides inside the calderas of past eruptions of the super volcano. Uh, the caldera is the region of the Earth's crust that collapses, filling in the void uh, left behind when magma uh, is released from the magma chamber uh, during an eruption. And uh, this picture that we see right here, this is a picture from the top of Mount Washburn, which is in the east central part of the park, looking more or less directly south. And uh, you see some of the features of the park here. Uh, back here in the distance is Yellowstone Lake. Um, this is the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone River right here. And over here is the Hayden Valley, uh, where we'll see lots of bison and other wildlife. And the Hayden Valley is named after Ferdinand Hayden, who was a geologist uh, and the leader of an expedition, a scientific expedition to the park in uh, 1871. He stood on top of Mount Washburn seeing more or less what we're seeing here and recognized uh, that the park, uh, much of the park, was the caldera of a, of a volcano, which is, is pretty amazing that he was able to recognize that. The Yellowstone supervolcano is a result of this enormous plume of magma that is emanating from the uh, deep inside the Earth's crust. And this plume of magma rises, in this picture here, there's Yellowstone, it rises to within a, a few miles of the surface in some areas in the Yellowstone area. So uh, this, this magma plume is not completely melted rock in all places. Uh, in some places you have liquid magma, in other places you have solid rock that has the potential of melting if, uh, if, if more heat is, is added from below. And in other regions, you have sort of this matrix of solid material and, and liquid material. But this plume of magma emanating from the Earth's mantle creates great uh, pressure and, and, and has caused the entire region to be elevated about 7,000 feet above uh, sea level. So the entire Yellowstone Plateau is, has been elevated by the, the, uh, the energy of this, of this magma plume. And of course, this magma plume is what supplies the heat for all of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features today. So this magma plume, this hotspot that resides under, uh, underneath Yellowstone today, in the past, it was further west. So what's happening is this plume of magma that's emanating from the Earth's mantle uh, is more or less stationary, but the North American plate is drifting westward. So the location of, of the eruptions of this supervolcano are migrating eastward as the North American plate migrates westward. So millions of years ago, eruptions of this supervolcano were further west. And over time, these eruptions have migrated eastward to the present location of the Yellowstone Plateau, where it resides today. So these repeated eruptions stretching back tens of millions of years into the past, the effect that it's had is, is these eruptions have obliterated a path through the Rocky Mountains, uh, which is where the Snake River flows today, through this plain, this valley, through uh, south central um, Idaho. It's a, a, an amazingly impressive sight to see a plain uh, from, created from these past eruptions surrounded by mountains when you know what caused this situation to arise, these repeated eruptions in the past of the supervolcano. And we'll see it. We're going to drive through the uh, this Snake River Valley when we're out there in Idaho. So for the past 2.1 million years, the hot spot um, has resided below the Yellowstone, uh, the location of Yellowstone National Park today, uh, and has created the Yellowstone Plateau. So what, I'm, what this figure is showing is outlines of the calderas of the last three major eruptions of this supervolcano. Um, the, uh, the first in the Yellowstone region today uh, happened about 2.1 million years ago and uh, created a caldera which is now partially covered by calderas of more recent eruptions, but it's referred to as the uh, Island Park caldera. 
and it gave rise to a, uh, a layer of ash that can be found over the entire western region of the United States uh, called the Huckleberry Ridge uh, Tuff Formation. And uh, when this uh, volcano erupted, it re released about 600 cubic miles of material, ash and debris. 600 cubic miles. It's unimaginable. Uh, about 1.3 million years ago, uh, the volcano erupted again, leaving a caldera in this area over here. And this is called the Henry's Fork Caldera. And it gave rise to a tuff formation called the Meza Falls Tuff Formation. Uh, so tuff, uh, we'll see another slide later. Tuff is a, a, a rock um, that's formed when ash falls and is compacted concreted uh, together and uh, it can happen um, so tuff is kind of like a sedimentary rock but it's also igneous because it arises from uh, uh, volcanic eruptions and um, uh, and uh, but ashfall from these eruptions can be found and the next slide shows this can be found all over the united states it's become a geological uh, signature of this uh, eruption in the rock layers all over the United States. So that, that eruption uh, 1.3 million years ago was much smaller and only ejected 67 cubic miles of, of debris and ash. Uh, the most recent eruption, which has given rise to the Yellowstone caldera, um, was 640,000 years ago. And uh, it has given rise to a tuff formation called the Lava Creek Tuff Formation. All right, so let's go to the next slide and I'll show you how uh, widespread ash fall had, was due to these eruptions of this supervolcano. It's hard to uh, uh, picture what uh, uh, 600 cubic miles of material is. So this next slide helps to communicate that by looking at a map of the United States. All right, so here's a map of the United States. Here's the Yellowstone Plateau. And what we see here are uh, outlines of where evidence of ashfall of these three most recent eruptions of the Yellowstone supervolcano can be found in the United States. Okay, so here is the, an outline of the Huckleberry Ridge ash bed. So geologists can find this ash bed in this entire region of the United States. And uh, so this is a res result of the uh, eruption 2.1 million years ago. Um, the eruption 1.3 million years ago gave rise to this Meza Falls ash bed, which can be found over this region of the United States. Uh, huge, as you can imagine, if the, volcano, if, it, if the Yellowstone volcano erupted today, how major an impact it would have on agriculture in the United States. If this entire region gets blanketed with ash, you're not going to be growing anything for quite some time. Uh, not to mention ash up in the uh, uh, upper atmosphere would cause a cooling effect, a global cooling effect, which would uh, 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 have major impacts on agriculture for many, many years, possibly decades. Uh, here is an outline of ash fall. Uh, where ash fall from the most recent eruption can be found, the Lava Creek ash bed. And uh, so that was from the eruption uh, uh, 640,000 years ago. All right, and just to give you a little idea of some other things. Oh, there's another outline on here. This is a, uh, there's an outline of, of an eruption a couple million years ago of a super volcano in California called um, the Long Valley Caldera. And, uh, and then just for comparison, in modern times, in 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, and that yellow region is where ash from that uh, volcanic eruption uh, was deposited in the wake of that eruption. All right, so as you can tell, the Yellowstone volcano, it's called a super volcano because the magnitude of, of its power when it erupts is just unlike anything that humanity has ever experienced in modern times. So in this picture right here, um, in this is near actually where we'll be camping, uh, near Madison Campground. And uh, as we're driving in here uh, in the Madison River Valley, 
when we come to the junction where uh, the campground is located, if you look north um, to the left as we're driving in from the west, you'll see what looks like a hillside or a, a mountainside. And, uh, but what you're actually looking at is the edge of the Yellowstone caldera, um, the edge of the volcanic caldera from the most recent eruption 640,000 years ago. Okay, so I think when we drive in to Yellowstone, maybe I won't say anything and we'll see if anybody notices it. So one of the features of a lot of the rock that is underneath Yellowstone National Park is, is a lot of the rock is, is really high in silica content. Silica is silicon dioxide. Uh, silicon and oxygen are uh, very abundant uh, elements in the Earth's crust, uh, but its, its presence in rock means that that rock has a, has a higher melting point, or when it does melt, it forms a much more viscous, thicker uh, substance, thicker lava. And uh, so one of the consequences of this is that the volcanic eruptions that involve high silica content material uh, is, uh, um, uh, tend to be more explosive. But uh, there also is uh, um, rock with less silica content that gives rise to, when it melts, gives rise to a type of lava called basalt. And uh, basalt lava, when it cools, forms a rock called basalt. And uh, we'll see evidence of past uh, basalt lava flows in the Yellowstone landscape. And uh, one of the really cool things that this lava does is if it cools sufficiently slow, it forms these uh, sort of these fragments, these vertical column-like uh, fragments uh, that have a sort of a polygon type cleaving uh, geometry. And uh, so one of them is uh, called Sheep Eater Cliff. Uh, sheep eaters were a, a tribe of Shoshone Indians um, that um, actually lived in Yellowstone in the past. Uh, so we'll try to stop there and take a look at this columnar basalt. But even if we don't stop there, you'll see it other places like on the south, uh, the lower uh, south, the, the lower region of the uh, of the Yellowstone, lower portion of the Yellowstone. Uh, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, you'll actually see two layers of, of this columnar uh, basalt uh, from two separate eruptions in the past. I think I have a picture of that later on. So here's that picture I was talking about. This is a picture of the canyon wall in the lower portion of the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone River. And you can clearly see two columnar basalt layers here from two different volcanic eruptions and subsequent lava flows, basaltic lava flows over the region. And uh, actually directly below these layers of basalt, you have layers of ashfall or tuff. So the volcano erupts, ash falls, either it falls from the sky or it, it gets deposited here as a result of pyroclastic flows, which are flows of, of, uh, of ash and superheated gases, which can just inundate a region very quickly in, in, the, in the course of a volcanic eruption. And uh, these pyroclastic flows are so hot that the ash can actually be welded together in the course of the eruption, forming what's called welded tuff. Uh, but ash fall over time, uh, gets consolidated and cemented together, uh, forming tough as well. So um, uh, we're definitely going to see this uh, at some place in the Yellowstone Canyon. Um, this this is near Tower Fall, which is pictured here. And Tower Fall is created because you have a region where there was a rhyolitic lava flow, which was more resistant to erosion. Um, and, uh, and, and thus over time, when the, uh, um, the, uh, the, the rock that was uh, more susceptible to erosion adjacent eroded away, you get a waterfall. But this rhyolitic lava, rhyolitic lava is just higher, has, just higher, has higher silicon content. Uh, it's also called felsic. Uh, and uh, rhyolitic lava flows tend to be more chunky in nature. Um, sort of a mixture of melted and partially melted stuff. It can flow just like basaltic lava, like the lava flows you would see in Hawaii or basalt uh, lava flows. Um, but it can also give rise to more explosive conditions uh, where you can have buildups of gas 
uh, and more violent eruptions because of the fact that the, the rhyolitic lava doesn't flow, it's more viscous uh, and, and um, can lead to conditions like that where there's a greater buildup of pressure. So uh, what you're seeing here, the, this is uh, rhyolitic breccias. And breccias are just uh, rocks that form when you have fragments of pre-existing rock that get uh, somehow, you know, physically broken, and they combine again and get cemented together uh, again. And uh, so uh, breccias are are they're, they're referred to as clastic uh, or clasts. Uh, clastic rock is just a rock that's formed when fragments of other rock get cemented together. Uh, oh, this is a petrified tree. It's a petrified redwood tree. Uh, and uh, it's a result of a volcanic eruption, not from the Yellowstone supervolcano, but another volcano uh, 50 million years ago that uh, before the, yellow, the hotspot was even in this area. Uh, but the ash fall from this volcano 50 million years ago covered a forest. And over time, as the organic material decayed, um, minerals from the ash uh, infiltrated the organic material, replacing the organic material with rocks and minerals, and you have a petrified tree. So here's a, another picture of a, uh, a breccia, and this one's beautiful. Uh, so this is uh, a breccia that was formed when uh, there was a, there's fragments of, of obsidian in here. And obsidian is, is volcanic glass. It's a, it's a high silica content material. Uh, so obsidian can form from rhyolitic lava when it, when it cools very quickly. Uh, when it cools very quickly, there's not time for, there, for crystalline structure to form. And so you get this amorphous solid, which is a glass. And uh, of course, obsidian cliffs in Yellowstone uh, was a very important location for Indians and Paleo Indians in this region. Uh, for uh, they harvested this obsidian material to make uh, uh, implements for hunting and cutting because obsidian can be uh, chipped, can be flaked, can be napped to form very sharp edges. Um, so uh, here's another a site we'll see. Uh, this is a, a, a small lake or pond that's right next to the, the main Yellowstone Lake. And um, it is called Indian Pond. And there's a nice little hike around the perimeter of this pond, um, which uh, maybe we'll do, a nice um, hour or so hike. And uh, But this, this pond was the result of uh, uh, an eruption, a volcanic, well, not, uh, an eruption of uh, a hydrothermal eruption, let's call it, called a phreatic eruption. So what you had is you had a buildup of pressure due to uh, superheated water uh, that built up sufficiently to cause the rock layers above where this chamber of superheated liquid to, existed to just be obliterated, forming a, a, this little tiny uh, caldera, um, which filled with water and became a pond. All right. So, you know, most of what we've been looking at in this uh, presentation so far are uh, rocks and formations that are the result of these past volcanic eruptions of the Yellowstone supervolcano. But of course, this hotspot is still here today providing heat to energize all the hydrothermal features that we'll see in Yellowstone. So let's take a look at some of these and talk in a little bit more detail about what was actually going on here. So Yellowstone, you say Yellowstone, probably the first thing you think of is geysers, Old Faithful. Here's a picture of a geyser in the same geyser space, uh, uh, the upper geyser basin, which is the same geyser basin where Old Faithful is located called Castle Geyser. I think it's in the upper geyser basin. I might be wrong. Uh, but uh, this map over here shows all the major geyser basins in Yellowstone. So here's the upper geyser basin, which is where Old Faithful resides, uh, the West Thumb Geyser Basin right along the Yellowstone Lake. So we'll, we're going to get a chance to visit several of these. All right. And of course, the, uh, the reason Old Faithful is called Old Faithful is because 
it erupts with amazing, uh, uh, um, with with amazing uh, frequency, and uh, and its eruptions can be predicted with a, an amazing degree of accuracy. Uh, so last time I was there, it was erupting about every 90 minutes or so, and uh, so when we go to the old faithful area. Uh, what we'll see is there'll be a sign where the a ranger has written on there. The next eruption is predicted at 2:23 p.m. or something like that. And so when the eruption is about to happen, there'll be this huge crowd of people that gathers around uh, to watch the eruption, and uh, it's like watching a pot boil, <laughs> as the saying goes. Um, you'll think it's about to start, but it's just a false start. And the eruption, uh, you'll, you'll get this little ejection of steam and some, some water, uh, but then it simmers down for a few more minutes and then it'll bubble up again and then it'll simmer down again. And then all of a sudden, the eruption starts and it grows and it grows and it grows and then it slowly diminishes. So what's actually happening under the, under the surface is uh, you have, uh, the geyser has a plumbing system and uh, this plumbing system are, are are voids that fill with with groundwater and uh, when the geyser erupts it takes some time for that groundwater uh, to be replaced for that water to be replaced for the groundwater to infiltrate into these voids and refill up the geyser plumbing and then it takes time for that uh, water to become heated enough to cause the next eruption and, and the reason the water erupts to begin with is you have um, uh, the, the plumbing of the geyser. You have these reservoirs of superheated water, but the plumbing has these little like choke points, these little narrow regions. Um, and uh, so what this ha what this results in is uh, water can build up to to be uh, uh, superheated, which means it has a temperature that's above the boiling point at atmospheric pressure but the water is subjected to higher pressure, so it doesn't boil. Uh, it, it's just, it's called superheated water. Um, but then as soon as a little bit of the water uh, gets uh, sufficiently hot uh, to boil in this region where there's uh, the plumbing is constricted, uh, when that water boils away, it creates a lower pressure region allowing more water to boil, which creates lower pressure, allowing more water to boil. So you get this positive feedback that gives rise to the eruption, where all of a sudden the pressure drops sufficiently for a large quantity of the water to flash into steam very quickly, creating the, uh, uh, the conditions to eject, you know, all this high pressure steam to eject the steam and water from the geysers, uh, subterranean plumbing. There used to be a uh, a model of a geyser in the in the old faithful visitor center uh, to demonstrate how this all works, and uh, I hope it's still there. Uh, we'll see several types of hot springs. So this is area where uh, hot water from uh, uh, hot groundwater emanates up to the surface, and so some of these hot springs have a little bit of a little like percolating activity. Uh, little mini geysers popping up out of these pools. Uh, this picture is of Mammoth Hot Springs. So here we have a, a situation where hot water um, is bubbling up through layers of limestone and the hot water dissolves that limestone and then when it gets to the surface the limestone or also known as calcium carbonate precipitates out of the water forming these terraces of a, a mineral called uh, travertine. So travertine is limestone that's precipitated out of water, uh, usually um, hot springs. Um, the, uh, another thing we'll see are these beautiful pools of, of um, uh, hydrothermically heated water. Um, and uh, this is a picture of Morning Glory Pool uh, in the upper geyser basin in the same area where Old Faithful is located. And uh, the reason that these pools are so colorful is because of the presence of thermophilic 
bacteria are also called ex uh, extremophiles. These bacteria can live in the really high temperatures that they would encounter inside of these, these uh, uh, hydrothermal pools. And uh, the reason you have different colors as you go out from the center of the pool is because those different colors are different uh, species of, of bacteria. And uh, they, these different species prefer different temperatures. So as you go out, the temperature drops, creating uh, ideal conditions for different species. And uh, so it turns out that one of these ex extremophiles uh, or thermophilic bacteria had a, uh, a form of the enzyme DNA polymerase, which was stable at high temperatures, unlike the version that's inside our bodies. And this was uh, incredibly important in molecular biology because uh, one of the, the tools that's used in modern molecular biology is called PCR or uh, for short for uh, uh, polymerase chain reaction. It's a, way, it's a technology, a technique for, for um, uh, rapidly duplicating, making copies of DNA. And this, uh, this, temperature, this high temperature stable version of DNA polymerase that was found in uh, thermophilic bacteria is an essential part of this technology, of this, this technique, PCR which is a foundation of all of our modern uh, molecular biology. We'll also see mud pots. So these are uh, hydrothermal features that occur in areas where you don't have as much groundwater. So the, the water and heat that's there uh, can uh, cause uh, rocks and minerals to uh, dissolve and you get this thick soupy material and there's, there can even be bacteria in these mud pots, which actually feed on these dissolved minerals. And um, the, uh, the gases that are emanating out of the mud pots uh, uh, can contain sulfur and other things which are somewhat smelly. So these, uh, this is a picture of the mud volcano. And when the, when the bubbles come out of the mud, it, it makes a mesmerizing sound. And these things you can just stare at and uh, um, just be sort of hypnotized by the bubbling uh, sounds and noises and, and patterns that emerge. Um, fountain pink pots is another mud pot uh, north of where Old Faithful is located. And finally, we'll also see what are referred to as fumaroles. Uh, fumaroles are hydrothermal features where you have very, very little water uh, below the surface and uh, the plumbing is not as constricted as you would find in the geyser. So instead of getting uh, eruptions like you do with a geyser or, um, or, or just uh, uh, pools of water like you would in a hot spring, what you have is just this, this uh, crack in the earth where steam and, and gases emanate can more or less continuously. So these gases, again, they can have a, a sulfur and other um, elements, uh, constituent elements, which uh, can be quite smelly. Uh, and uh, But one trip to Yellowstone, my wife and I discovered a fumarole that uh, was just popping up in the middle of a field uh, that was covered in, in grasses and other vegetation. And I swear, we, we named this fumarole nutmeg fumarole because the combination of the hot gases flowing through this vegetation was just creating this most wonderful smell that reminded us of nutmeg. On our next visit to the park, nutmeg geyser or nutmeg fumarole, fumarole was gone. It disappeared. And so that's another feature of Yellowstone's hydrothermal features. Some of them have persisted for generations, over a hundred years. Uh, and, and some like Old Faithful uh, erupt consistently for that entire time. But there's other geysers that erupt very infrequently and very unpredictably. And uh, some haven't erupted for decades. And then all of a sudden they'll come alive and they'll erupt once and then they'll go to sleep for another couple decades or they'll, they'll be dormant for several years and then they'll just erupt very vigorously for a couple weeks and then go back to a dormant 
uh, situation for many, many more years. So the, the hydrothermal, this, these systems are dynamic and the hydrothermal features that define the landscape uh, aren't fixed, they're changing and in many times changing in, in time frames which are uh, observable by human beings. And uh, uh, that every once in a while I'll read that um, there's a new uh, geyser basin that's forming or a, a region uh, of the park which was previously forest or vegetation, uh, but something shifted below the surface to cause a buildup of heat, which has then resulted in the death of all that vegetation. Uh, and, uh, and we'll see lots of evidence as well. You'll see trees that are uh, dead trees in the geyser basins. Um, you'll see dead trees in mammoth hot springs. So places in the past where that were suitable for plant growth are now unsuitable because of the hydrothermal activity. All right, so that's enough for this lesson. And this was a long one, uh, about 30 minutes. Uh, but this is an important one. And uh, we'll talk some more about the uh, hydrothermal features in class, and uh, and and uh, we'll we'll talk more about other geological features of the region in a later lesson. All right, that's it.